We are going live, sir, in five, four, three, two, one, and we're live. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I bring greetings from IAGS office. I'm Dr. Ishra Murthy, the Honorable Secretary. With me, I have our president, Professor Sunil Puppet, along with the Dr. Meenakshi. She is the North Zone Vice President, also the FAGS convener. Today, we are going to see in week five in Indo-UK Surgical General Laparoscopy on Professor Tegman Udwadia's operation. But before that, I have a couple of pleasant duty to perform. One, of course, is uh, Dr. Minakshi is going to tell once we finish myself and uh, Professor Sunil Puppet our keynote addresses. She is going to wrap up on what happened in the last five days in the general laparoscopy session, being a session coordinator. She is going to give an overview on this. In the meantime, I'm sure our president is going to invite you all for the forthcoming on-site programs that I'm sure it will be happening in this uh, very place in Guaymatu and with the KMCH live program. But in the meantime, I want to ensure that you all had your vaccines and you're all up with an upbeat mood because we have already started in the IAGS calendar this year under the leadership of Professor Sunil Puppet with our first on-site program in GSL Medical College Raja Munduri. And as you can see the glimpses of the pictures here with uh, all these legends on the stage after 13 long months we have. So let us on behalf of all of you viewers, uh, all the members of IAGS, and my dear colleagues, let us welcome Professor Sunil Puppet, President of IAGS 2021-2022, who is a great academician and a teacher par excellence, who is a very busy laparoscopic and endoscopic surgeon in Ahmedabad, Director Nidhi Hospital, Honorary Professor GSL Medical College, Raja Mundari, and also now our president, and regarding our vision, mission, IAGS, 2021-2022. Over to you, President. Thank you, Honorary Secretary, Dr. Ishwamurthy, for your kind words. IAGS, dear friends, I'm very pleased to invite you to this evening's online IAGS program. IAGS is in its 28th year. In 1993, by 25 to 30 founding members of IGS. It was started in Mumbai and over the last 28 years, it has grown leaps and bounds. I'm happy and privileged to be 17th president of IGS. I'm also very happy to meet you all through this wonderful platform of DocPlexus. Last year, because of COVID pandemic, IGS could not do any on-site programs, but under the visionary leadership of Dr. Raman Goel and IGS executive committee, we had plenty of online programs all throughout the year. One of the program which was done online and was very successful was Indo-UK Surgicon. And we have been rerunning the good part, the best part of Indo-UK Surgicon since last five weeks and it will continue for another three weeks. Every Friday, we do the wrap up of the programs which have been run online during the first four days. Friends, IAGS started the fellowship program of laparoscopic surgery known as FIAGES in 2007. And now we have completed almost 50 on-site programs of FIAGES. I was happy to have our first on-site program after 13 months as shown in pictures by Dr. Ishwamurti. Recently in Rajmundri at GSL Medical College, we did FIAGES and EFIAGS, the endoscopy FIAGS. And there were more than 250 surgeons participating. Both the programs were done simultaneously in two different halls. And there was live transmission from UK, from Hyderabad, from Pune, 
and GSL Medical College itself. GSL Medical College, under the leadership of Dr. Gani Bhaskar, showed how to do a physical program in this COVID pandemic time, taking all the due precautions. Friends, if the incidence and prevalence of COVID pandemic permits, we are planning to do such programs across the country. By chance, God forbid, if there is increase in the incidence and prevalence of COVID, then we may do more programs online than on-site. IAGES started Advanced Fellowship Laparoscopy Surgery Program in 2012. In 2016, it was subdivided into five subspecialties like false upper GI, false bariatric, false hernia, false colorectal, false robotics. Last year, first time on the online platform, we did first false, false oncology. This year also, we plan to do a new false, which is false robotic surgery in the later part of the year. We also do endoscopic FIAGES as we did in Rajmundri and also advanced endoscopic fellowship, which is known as FAGI. Friends, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the laparoscopic surgery the gold standard laparoscopic surgery done by each and every laparoscopic surgeon. However, though it is being done since more than 35 years, there are still dreadful complications we are seeing and we are facing in our day-to-day -day practice. To help reduce the incidence of this complication, we at IAGS have decided to make a safe lab quality task force which will do skill courses on laparoscopic cholecystectomy and its safety to reduce the complication, to prevent the complications of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. We intend to do five to six such skill courses in different parts of the country during the year. And this will definitely attract many general surgeons, laparoscopic surgeons. This will be a 1.5 to 2 days program in which there will be a live workshop for half a day and didactic sessions, master videos and one-to-one -one interaction with endolab training on knotting and suturing for 1 to 1.5 days. The course will be looked after by IAGES task force on laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Similarly, we have made another task force this year, which is known as laparoscopic hernia task force. Laparoscopic hernia surgeries are being done in India since more than 25 years. However, the numbers of laparoscopic hernia surgeries are still 10 to 15% of the total hernia surgeries being performed. The reason being the training is not easily available, the anatomy, and technicality of laparoscopic hernia surgery is difficult. To make it easier, to take it to the budding surgeons, young surgeons, we have devised this uh, laparoscopic hernia task force. The task force will organize a skill course on laparoscopic hernia surgery, again for 1.5 to 2 days, in which there is a live workshop, there will be live workshop for half a day, which will show laparoscopic inguinal hernia surgeries in the form of TAPP, TEP, ETEP. And also it will have laparoscopic ventral hernia surgeries such as IPOM, IPOM Plus. We will also have brief introduction to the abdominal wall reconstruction just for the surgeons to understand the concept of it. Friends, we are working hard to make these skill courses available to you in different parts of the country. And hopefully, once the COVID situation goes down, we'll be able to bring it to your doorstep. Friends, this year is unique in which we are going to have two national conferences. Our national conference 
which is known as IAGS National Congress of 2021 will be held in Coimbatore and the organizing secretary is none other, none other than our honorary secretary, Dr. Ishwa Murthy, under the chairmanship of Dr. L.P. Thangavelu, our president-elect. Coimbatore is known for its academics since many years. Coimbatore is known for laparoscopy since more than two decades. And it would be wonderful for you to come to Coimbatore and attend this IAGS 2021 in person. IAGS team is working very hard along with the local organizing team. And I am sure this will be a memorable conference for all of us. Secondly, we are going to have IAGS 2022 in February 22. It will be organized in Rajmundri. This will be organized under the chairmanship of Dr. Gani Bhaskar Rao. Rajmundri is famous for its academics. It has its own airport. It's a small city with all the facilities. GSL Medical College, the venue of the organ the venue of the conference has all the facilities in addition to the state-of-the-art state of smart lab. The smart lab at GSL Medical College is one of the best in the world. It provides all kinds of simulation for GI endoscopy and laparoscopic surgery. Gradually, over the last several years, IAGS has incorporated simulation as part of the training in its fellowship and skill courses. Friends, all these informations are available on IAGS website and very soon it will be available at your fingertips on our newly coming up mobile app. Friends, IAGS is also having IAGS prime time, which is a fortnightly program for uh, showcase live on Docplexus on Sunday evening, where the eminent faculties from our nation as well as across the world are invited to present their experience, their work, and to show us their technique of doing various laparoscopic surgery. Friends, at IAGS, the founding father of which is Professor Udwadia. He has always shown us how to excel in difficult conditions. And IAGS has been doing it since the last 28 years. It has become one of the most academic and most vibrant surgical organization of our country and abroad. We are all standing together to work hard and to rise beyond the horizon. I'm sure you are all going to join us in this, our journey to the surgical excellence. I once again invite you to this edition of IAGS Indo-UK Surgicon. And today we are going to have Professor Udwadia's oration. Friends, looking forward to see you all throughout the year, online and on-site. And I'm sure we'll all work hard to make IAGS proud. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President, for your tactful, very enchanting speech. I am sure all our members and all the people, surgeons across the globe will be looking at IAGS to see what we are going to offer them in the academic and social front. Thank you very much. I'll now request Dr. Meenakshi to come and tell what's happened in the last few days and also introduce the oration for today. Over to you, Dr. Meenakshi. Hello. Uh, good evening. Good evening, uh, my seniors, my esteemed seniors and dear friends from IAGS. And it's a great honor uh, to be speaking on this platform. I'm very grateful for that. I, as I was very grateful to be the coordinator of the general laparoscopy session in uh, uh, the Indo-UK Surgicon, which was a huge hit. I couldn't uh, 
believe the way uh, you know people like the sessions and the way the expert talks and everything was received and we had such great reviews and from one event and from the re telecast of these expert talks and the sessions which have been run in the past week since the 2nd of march uh, we also had the great news of the first on site fellowship course in the post uh, and uh, covid era and uh, we had a hugely successful fiajs plus efiajs combined in the uh, uh, in the uh, this great city of rajamundry which i am sure is going to be the next seat of learning and where we are also having our next annual conference in the year 2022 and this uh, fellowship was attended by more than 200 delegates and a great learning experience was had by all and with that uh, i would like to introduce the oration the uh, next oration by uh, the uh, our um, sorry by the next oration which was carried on in the hall a in the not in the hall a the general hall in the indo uk surgicon can we go to the oration it's a matter of great honor to introduce professor tempton erak udwadia founder president of the indian association of gastrointestinal endosurgeons scheduled to deliver the presidential oration during this indo uk surgicon 2020 Professor Udwadia was born in Mumbai on the 15th of July 1934 to Dr. Erak, a general practitioner, and Perrin, both of whom had profound influence on him. He completed primary education from St. Mary School, Wilson College, and St. G.S. Medical College and K.M. Hospital, Mumbai. After obtaining the master's degree, he trained in the U.K. and obtained his F.R.C.S. from England and Edinburgh. Professor Udwadia joined Grant Medical College and Sir J J Group of Hospitals as an honorary surgeon in 1963. In recognition of his unstinting work for the underprivileged and contribution to teaching, he was awarded the title of Emeritus Professor of Surgery upon his superannuation in 1994. With aim of early diagnosis of abdominal conditions, he embraced diagnostic laparoscopy way back in 1972 and championed it. Professor Udwadia performed the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy in India in May 1990. However, not one to rest on his laurels, he travelled across rural India with missionary zeal to conduct workshops and propagate laparoscopic surgery for benefit of masses. Thanks to his vision, India today has emerged the hub of advanced laparoscopic surgery. At the age of 78. when most surgeons would be happy to hang up their boots he was instrumental in starting the center of excellence for minimal access surgery training in 8 years this world class training institute trained over 8000 surgeons across 16 facilities as a natural leader professor udwadia has spearheaded and guided several organizations <coughs> he has been founder president of iigs president of the association of surgeons of india Indian chapter of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy of India Indian section of International College of Surgeons the world body of International College of Surgeons Society of Endoscopic and Laparoscopic Surgeons of Asia and International Federation of Societies of Endoscopic Surgeons he is the only Indian to have been elected president to the last three international bodies Professor Udwadia's awards and recognitions too numerous to detail include Padma Shri in 2006 and Padma Bhushan in 2017 from the Government of India Colonel Pandalai Oration of the ASI Dr B C Roy Award of the Medical Council of India for promoting the specialty of laparoscopic surgery in India Ontarian Professorship of the Royal College of Surgeons of England Surgicos Lecture of the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland Sir James Ross Lecture of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh 
Dr. Carl Storr's Lecture Award of the Society of American Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons or SAGES, Honorary Fellowship of the American College of Surgeons and the Order of British Empire from Queen Elizabeth II. He also received the George Bursey Lifetime Achievement Award in Endoscopic Surgery at the SAGES Annual Meeting in 2014. As a matter of pride to every Indian, in 2017, he was invited by the Einstein Foundation to speak at the Innovation Summit of 100 most influential personalities in the world and to contribute to the first 3D printed book, Genius, 100 Visions of the Future. Professor Udwadia has published over 90 papers in peer reviewed journals and has to his credit several book chapters and obviously author of two landmark books, Laparoscopic Cholecystectomy and Laparoscopic Surgery in Developing Countries. He has served on the editorial boards of international journals and was the chairman of the editorial board of Indian Journal of Surgery and is the Emeritus Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Minimal Access Surgery. As an active sportsman, he represented and captained his school and college in cricket, boxing, athletics, and led the cricket team of St. J.S. Medical College. He was also an active member of debating and education teams through his ac academic career. He remains an avid golfer till death. Mr. President, executive members of IGS, faculty, delegates of Indo-UK Surgicon 2020, it is my honor and privilege to present to you Professor Tempton Erat Udwadia, sir, to deliver the presen presidential oration on making of a surgeon during Indo-UK Surgicon Conference today on the 16th of October 2020. Sir, over to you. Distinguished uh, ch chairpersons, friends from all over India, the UK and neighboring countries, Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I feel that I'm reasonably uh, qualified to talk on the subject of making of a surgeon because I have traveled on this path from 1956. From 1956, I've traveled on this path and I've stumbled and walked and skid and fallen all along this tall, long and tortuous path for 64 years. And I'm hoping that I'll soon come to the end of this path and become a surgeon before I kick the bucket. I assure you, my talk will not be pedantic or learned or profound. All I'm going to talk about is my experiences during this journey. This is uh, my alma mater, the KM Hospital and the GS Medical College. And the motto of our, my alma mater is that you are here not to worship what you are taught, but to question it. And this was dinned into us throughout our tenure as medical students. It taught us that half of what you are taught by your teachers will in 10 years be shown to be wrong. The real trouble is, None of your teachers know which half will be wrong. And that created in us an immediate sense of uh, worry about the sanctity of evidence-based medicine. I'm nothing against uh, protocols, SOPs, checklists, but I do feel that evidence-based medicine is the greatest roadblock to surgical progress. This is Dr. Tungaukar, a surgeon in rural semi-tribal area in Maharashtra, who, with together some of his friends in similar areas, decided that they would give the gold standard for hernia repair to their poor patients, tension-free mesh repair. And the only mesh they could afford was the simple mosquito net, which was available in everybody's home in the villages. They did several hundred cases together and sent the combined report to me to the Indian Journal of Surgery, and as editor, I was delighted and proud to print it and publish it. Within two weeks, I got strong messages from heads of departments of uh, all India institutes, castigating me for accepting such a shad shoddy, untried, 
un, un uh, properly documented paper where there was no collateral research and no evidence of animal research. And I wrote to them that if uh, animal research is to be done, it cannot be done by surgeons working in five bed nursing homes in the periphery. It has to be done by the surgeons in five star hospitals and teaching hospitals. However, we decided to try out this mesh in two tertiary care hospitals. But before trying it out, we, what we did was send it to IIT Kanpur, the hub of the textile industry, where they compared the two mesh, the, the commercial mesh and the mosquito net, and found that there was no difference actually between the two mesh, except the fact that the mosquito net cost 40 rupees per square meter. In other words, per patient, the cost would come to the cost of four cups of tea, the cost any Indian patient could afford. And today, this mosquito net is being used for hernia repair, not only in India, but all over Africa and in South America, Asia, thanks to the rural surgeons getting together and herniologists like uh, Knight North, etc., uh, getting into the picture. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the world that we live in today. And when we talk of nano surgery and things like that, please remember that the Lancet Commission on World Health, World Surgery rather, informs us that 5 billion people do not have access to safe, affordable, and available surgical care. And as the good book says, what happens to the best of us also affects me. The only truth in surgery is change. From the dawn of surgery, the surgeon has been using his eye at the tip of his finger for his surgery. For that matter, Shushuta said that the best surgical instrument is the surgeon's hand. However, now the surgeon's fingertip is transferred to the tip of a long instrument which has no sensation. This is Eric Boe, who in 1985 did the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Over the years, we have become good friends, and he looks very smart and cheerful in his picture. But his first instrument was made out of the tubing of his daughter's bicycle, and Storrs was good enough to give him a telescope. As soon as the professors heard of what heretical and heterodox surgery was doing, he was commanded to stop immediately or he would be debarred. Either out of courage or foolishness, Moe continued. His 87th patient had a bile leak, an injury to the bile duct, and his professors had him tried for manslaughter, and he spent in court, on bail, or in jail the next five years of his life. Truly, we have all felt that in surgery, the truth often starts as blasphemy. And as Adash Chaudhary once spoke, the only thing that is original is foolishness. My mentors taught me many things. One of them, the senior most mentor, Dr. Cooper, said, there is no minor surgery there are only minor surgeons and insisting that there can be no complacency in surgery. And his last words to us in his last clinic before our postgraduate exam was, my greatest joy and pride is that my residents are doing bigger and better surgery than I ever did. I think this is the ultimate hallmark of a master mentor. And they taught us more than surgery. They taught us character. You may reach the highest success, but your character still lacks what can only be given by the, to give permanence to power, the grace of humility, hostile and equanimity. As a house surgeon in 1957, we had a lot of burns patients in the KEM hospital. And the house surgeon had to do all the burns dressings after the operation list was over and before visiting ours. 
In my hiring, I must have been rough and must have hurt a patient. Dr. Karmaka, my chief, was standing behind me. Had he shouted, you bumbling, uh, ham-handed fool, is this the way you dress patients? I would have forgotten it before I went to the next patient. But Dr. Karmaka walked up to me, put his hand on my shoulder and said, Udwadia, the surgeon must himself feel the patient's pain. I've never come across a better definition of empathy and this has lived with me all my life. Again, when he was assisting me for a recurrent hernia, he said, Udwadia, do you notice how soft and supple the tissue is? Absence of scar tissue is the signature of a gentle surgeon. And on another occasion, another mentor, Dr. Paliga said, Udwadia, why don't you go and tell the relatives of a very, very upper crust patient that the time for post our mentors didn't stand on podiums and platforms to tell us this. This was a one-to-one -one talk on the on rounds, on uh, the operation table, in the OPDs. My colleague for 25 years, Dr. Rasik Patel, every new batch of residents we got would say there are three types of surgeons. Those who learn from others' mistakes, those who learn from their own mistakes, and those who don't. And he said, you can take, make your choice for yourself. Surgery is a very cruel teacher. All teachers take a lesson, teach a lesson, and then take the exam. Surgery takes the exam and then teaches a lesson. This is the JJ Hospital, one of the oldest hosp teaching hospitals in the country, where I had the pride, privilege, and pleasure to work for 32 years, three to six hours every day, doing honorary patient care, research, and teaching. And this is my ward in 1971. We had a tertiary care GI HPV unit and with an allotted span of 20 patients. At any one time, we had 50 to 70 patients in our ward. And we learned that it is the patients, it is your mentors, it is your registrars who you learn from more than you teach and the nursing staff that helps you on the road to make yourself a surgeon. The reason for this overcrowding because the infrastructure at JJ was so poor that even a simple barium meal would take four weeks to materialize. And then I saw a gynecological colleague do a diagnostic laparoscopy. And I realized that that was the fastest way of early diagnosis and rapid patient turnover. We couldn't afford it, but with what instruments we had, we could take, we could see a visual and a biopsy diagnosis so that our bed turnover increased greatly. Foolishly, I presented this at an international conference in Bombay, at the Bombay Hospital. And the chairman, a very senior surgeon, got up and said, this young surgeon is a coward. I enter the abdomen through wide open doors whilst he peeps through the keyholes of my doors. To the amusement, laughter of the entire audience and my embarrassment. However, I took strength from knowing that there are two other surgeons, George in uh, Los Angeles and Alfred in Dundee, who are equally dedicated to diagnostic laparoscopy. And when laparoscopic surgery came on the scene, I'd never seen a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So we created our own model out of a plastic box, made our own uh, simulator where we could tie knots, uh, ligate, suture, and use raw rice, cooked rice, and overcooked rice to get the sense of feel or strength required to hold the tissue. At that time, I had never heard of the word haptics, but I think that is what we were trying to teach ourselves. And then fortunately, Alfred Kosheri had done a lab coli a few weeks earlier, and he was kind enough to send me his huge cassette or whatever it was called those days. And we studied that cassette in depth, 
and every night one of the one or two of the jj residents would come over home and we would practice eye and coordination late into the night as best as we could and please see this is the camera we had at this time this is the size of the camera first camera we used compared to what we use today and with uh, the benefit of uh, alfred's uh, tape and our uh, monitoring at home we with great rapidity took on the first lab poly the surgical staff of ward 19 jj hospital did the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the developing world and immediately we were drowned in criticism even abuse surgeons from england wrote in indian journals that laparoscopic cholecystectomy is inappropriate in developing countries these natives must remain to remain the way they are and even more sadly indian surgeons wrote in english journals questioning the ethics of those who did laparoscopic surgery my reply to them was prompt that 70% of the population in developing countries are daily wages manual laborers the benefit of early work return to work makes laparoscopic surgery a socio economic boom to them laparoscopic surgery has its ultimate application in developing countries so today we don't operate on patients we operate on the images and hence simulation is an absolute necessity in the training process of making of a surgeon today because the patient cannot be used as a guinea pig or training model for the ms novice but let me remind you that basic general surgery will always be the foundation of all surgery and i do believe that laparoscopic surgery is the logical extension and progress of open surgery brought about by new technology and new equipment so we come to the box trainer and i have always taught all trainees practice does not make perfect only perfect practice makes perfect otherwise you perpetuate a mistake by going on practicing and one doesn't need sophisticated simulation to learn eye hand coordination this is an exercise all 8000 participants have gone through because i believe it is an excellent exercise for patients because when you putting the six block the whole block might fall down for precision because the blocks have to be exact in line and facing the right way and in haptics because if you hold the uh cube too hard you too gently it will fall off and if you hold the cube too hard the sugar crystals will disintegrate and you will notice that there are only two sugar cubes uh, two sugar crystals here showing that this is a very good haptic performance and then we come to the animal lab where we train and we train to ensure that the minimal excess surgeon is a master in handcraft and of course it is mandatory to have the virtual reality lab but all participants are convinced that the animal lab gives them far better training than the virtual reality lab that is the feedback we got in our training center and so we have created a surgeon who is a master hand craftsman but as uh, meo said we have seen many master uh, operative surgeons who do not make operative technicians who do not make good surgeons because the aim of surgery is to be much more than creating a surgical acrobat the aim of surgery is to create the complete surgeon and for the complete surgeon two skills are required operative skills or hand skills which constitute only 35% of the requirement of a good surgeon on the other hand the non operative skills 
constitute 65 percent because adverse effect, events often occur from non-technical skills rather than lack of technical expertise and the non-operative skills are cognitive which means decision making planning anticipation ingenuity and a hundred other similar skills and interpersonal leadership teamwork empathy to keep your cool and another hundred similar skills and the important thing is that non-surgical non-technical skills are rarely taught and hence they have to be self-taught by the trainee in the course of his residency as he interacts with his mentors i'm convinced that there is no better method of making of a surgeon than the traditional health study and or the shushuta in different countries this is becoming more and more difficult to do concerns of finance of time stops of legal problems but fortunately you know in different countries it's not easy was the most difficult mentor I have worked with and I worked with him for 10 years first as his research fellow then as his registrar then as his research associate then when I was his associate surgeons at the JJ took objection that I could not be in a teaching hospital in two teaching hospitals at the same time so then said you become my PhD student and finally I was this PhD student and my PhD thesis whilst I was doing uh, uh, GI and HPB surgery at the JJ was a new approach to myocardial revascularization whereby we tried to revascularize the mammalian heart on the lines of the anatomy of the reptile heart and the reptile we used was the Russell Viper. Our work was published in several journals this one was in 1965 and was well accepted but when I submitted my thesis, it was thrown out of the window and to add insult to injury, Professor Sen was demoted as a guide for the PhD for such absurd research. When I went to meet him, he said, Udwadiya, why are you looking so dejected? Failure is not a defeat. Success is not the destination. Success is the journey. And for four years, We've had such a wonderful journey, doing our work, enjoying our work, and thinking and being convinced that what work we are doing is good work. That is not the end of the story. 30 years later, long after P.K. Sen had passed away, this method we described and which was published is today, and thanks to the advent of lasers, is today an accepted method of myocardial revascularization. Really, in surgery, truth often starts as blasphemy. The surgeon is very often a very, very, very lonely individual. He might be the loneliest person in the world. At rounds, he might be surrounded by students, his residents, nurses. But when he's seeing a patient, suffering from the complications of surgery, seriously ill, and he has to take the call whether to reoperate re or not. At that time, he is terribly, terribly lonely. Or when there's a surgical calamity at surgery, he has the best of assistance, but he knows that ultimately he has to take the buck. And believe me, that is a very, very lonely buck. And if there is ever a fatality, not only does the patient die, but with every fatality, a part of the surgeon also dies. And the rest of him, for a long time, is very lonely. And hence, in the making of a surgeon, I got married in 1959. In the making of a surgeon, it's important to have a family, someone at home, who can share your loneliness and make sure that you recover from your failures. All my mentors, and there are many of them, 
tried their utmost to teach me the science of surgery. And I can hear them now calling out from, from above, Udwadia, we did our best to try and make a surgeon out of you. So now don't blame us for the mess you're in. But my father, a simple general practitioner, taught me the art of how to become a doctor. My father worked from 1922 to 1986 in the poorest, the slum ghettos of the mill area of Lower Perez. And I had the opportunity to work with him in his dispensary when as a medical student, because after cricket practice at the nearby GS Medical College, Jimkhana, I would walk over to his dispensary and see him work. And I could feel the vibes and I couldn't help telling myself that this was the Albert Schweizer of Lower Perez, because his entire work was based on three pillars, compassion, care, and cure. And I think that is what ultimately all medicine and surgery is all about. Am I on the screen? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank no, you, Professor Rudwadi, yes, sir. One second. Don't push me. Uh, one of my father's favorite stories was about Ambrose Paré, the famous French surgeon who cut surgeons down to size by saying, I dress his wounds, but God healed them. And he was also the royal surgeon to four consecutive monarchs of France, including Louis Cato's The Sun King. On one occasion, he kept The Sun King waiting for two hours. And when Paré sheepishly entered the royal chambers, the king said, you have kept your king waiting for two hours. You will treat your king much better than you treat your patients. And Ambrose, uh, Ambrose Paré sheepishly said, I cannot do that, sir. I cannot. What? Why cannot you treat your king better than your patient? And Ambrose Pare looked up directly to the surgeon, to the king, and said, Sire, because I treat all my patients as kings and queens. The surgery that we are seeing today is, and the advance that is being occurred in surgery in the last century, I think is far greater than the progress in surgery over all the millennia before these last 70 years. When I was a house surgeon, a blood transfusion was a surgical event. Today we are seeing a magnitude of surgery which was unthought of, unbelievable, which would be beyond science fiction. And today, and previously, the surgeon was doing simple surgery with basic instruments. Today, the magnitude of surgery is, is, is impossible to comprehend in magnitude, in complexity, and the technical advances and technology are imaginable, unimaginable. And yet, somewhere along the way, I think, the surgeon has lost the way. Six years back, the surgeon was looked upon with respect, with awe, almost like a deity. Today, the surgeon is viewed with a bit of suspicion, apprehension, perhaps even dislike. And it is for us to self-introspect and find out what has been the cause of this great disparity and the great distance created between the patient and the surgeon. I have for years always taught my residents that the most important point in a patient's 24 hours is when the consultant comes for rounds. And if he does not talk to the patient and talk not about the patient's illness, but if the patient has enjoyed his breakfast, has slept well, then I'm afraid the whole visit is lost. I think we should introspect and find out how we can come back close to our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was a very inspirational speech.